Um, I'm very happy to have Simon Moosen here. He's a magazine writer um, and someone who's had a lot of interesting things to say um, about journalism and informed consent. Um, so I'll let Simon take it away. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm super excited about our, our panel today. Um, I'm gonna introduce the three panelists whose faces I'm sure I'll be able to see up on that screen in just a moment. Um, so anyway, but, uh, while, while I'm waiting for them to appear on the screen, uh, our three panelists today are uh, Bruce Gillespie, who's someone who's written uh, quite uh, provocatively and thoughtfully about a lot of the topics we're talking about today, and is a professor at the Digital Media and uh, Journalism School at Will Laboria University. Uh, J.D. Mingan, who's a kind of rising star in the journalism world. J.D. is a National Magazine Award-nominated writer, and she's the editor-in-chief of the Varsity newspaper at the uh, University of Toronto. And then Lisa Taylor, who is a professor at the uh, Toronto Metropolitan University and is uh, a former journalist and also a former lawyer. So somebody for whom conversations about journalism and ethics, I think, come quite naturally. Um, so really, really excited to have all three of you here today. I wanted to start by talking about this sort of sea change that I think has happened in journalism. I think there was a moment of time, a moment in time, not very long ago, where having a conversation like the one we're about to have would have seemed kind of unprofessional or uh, naive or sentimental. There was a sense that as a journalist, you work for the public. You don't work for your sources and you're not supposed to care too much about your sources because you don't work for them. And so if the experience of talking to you is somehow traumatizing for a source, or if the source consents without really knowing what they're consenting to, that was okay professionally because your, your duty is to the public, not to your sources. And we've reached a moment in time where I think a lot of us are starting to feel really uncomfortable with that way of thinking. And my first question to whoever wants to start is what's changed in the last five years? Maybe we'll go, go left to right. So we'll start with Bruce. Thanks, Simon. Um, I think a lot of change has changed, right? Um, I think, um, interestingly for me, this sort of sea change in journalism uh, is quite a long time coming. We sort of saw these issues in, in academia or with people who work with um, human sources, as we call them, um, back in the 60s and 70s, there was this crisis of representation. And I think we're finally sort of seeing that in journalism, that when you're dealing with um, vulnerable human sources who are sharing personal information with you a lot of the time and, and, and anecdotal details, um, that there's some care that should be taken with them. To my mind, the other big change, and it's not new necessarily, but I think it sort of struck people differently, is that, you know, 25 years ago, news was really ephemeral. If there was an embarrassing story or a terrible story about you in the paper today, people probably talked about it for a couple of days, and then it was done. Um, that's not the case anymore. News has a, has a much longer tail, thanks to the internet and algorithmic search engines. So I think people are a lot more concerned about um, where this information lives and how long it lives. Um, not sure what that was about. Uh, let's hear from JD. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have only really been in the field the last couple years, so I wouldn't be the best gauge for how things have changed broader than that. But um, something to add on to what Bruce said is that I think a lot of people are like concerned about repercussions since their names are so easily Googleable. Like um, I'm editor in chief of the varsity and the most common unpublishing request I get is like, I am having trouble getting jobs or like securing uh, other sorts of um, opportunities because my name is on public record can be easily searched. Sometimes we've like reported on when people have been in like accidents or um, gotten injuries on campus and that kind of like medical history can be kind of problematic to be out there. Um, these are people's private information that we often put out there. I think it's important to think about the amount of power we have as journalists over people's lives. Um, and yeah, just the fact that it is so easy to find now causes problems for people. Can I ask, Jadine, do you, do you often honor those requests? It's, it's complicated. I, I do have to weigh a couple of different factors whenever I get those. I do my mm -hmm. best, though, to um, protect people as much as I can. And often I do end up removing people's names from the record because when they do come forward with these requests, it's often like after some time of thinking about it, after like prolonged problems. Um, and as long as they can demonstrate that, I don't see a problem with um, reducing the amount of like identifi identifiable information that's available. Mm 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I think the fact that you feel that way shows the extent to which there has been a kind of sea change in journalism. Uh, let, let's hear from Lisa. Sure. And I'd love to pick up on something that Jadine just said. It is this idea of um, starting to look at ways that we can kind of reduce the identification. This was presented by journalists and among journalists for ever as this false dichotomy. Are we going to unpublish this or aren't we? Um, As opposed to thinking about the range of things we can do to reduce exposure, yet still not um, suggest to our audience that there aren't real people affected by a thing. So first of all, we got rid of that narrative that just doesn't stand up to any kind of intellectual scrutiny. And and I think um, it's been, along with the great um, kind of (laughs) opportunities for humility in journalism over the past decade or so. I think with that humility has come um, a corresponding increase um, in compassion, in an understanding that we do make really huge asks of sources, asks that, uh, as Bruce mentioned, were far smaller um, before the advent of of an internet that never forgets. So, So that compassion, I think, behooves us, if we're at all reasonable people, to start to rethink this supposed sacrosanct rule, because it's really problematic. Yeah, I mean, any journalist who has a, 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 a heart or a soul knows that what we ask is just extraordinary, and we don't compensate people. And, and often uh, what we're asking is just goodwill. Share with me what you have. Give me your story, um, and I will say thank you, and then I will get a byline and a paycheck. Um, and it's weird to me that we ever thought that didn't come with some kind of corresponding uh, duty of care. But, uh, but, but it seems like in the past, we were, we were often very resistant to that idea of, of, of a duty of care. And I guess that sort of leads me to my next question, which is what is required of informed consent? What, does it, what do you have to do in order to get uh, in, informed consent? Um, and maybe we'll, we'll go the other way. We'll start with Lisa this time. Um, we, to get whatever the journalistic equivalent of informed consent uh, can, is going to be is something that I'll get to in just a second. I'm still a little uncomfortable with the term informed consent. And, and I don't mean the mm-hmm. level of concern of, of kind of care that we're offering. I, I get, I see a co-equal level. The problem when we try to kind of perfectly apply the medical notion of informed consent is that, you know, your surgeon will go through with you kind of, you know, the, the risks, um, you know, relative to, to perhaps her skill and, and your illness. Um, but she doesn't have to contemplate the fact that maybe a plane will drop on the hospital while you're in the middle of the procedure. And partly the challenge with informed consent in journalism is we can't really kind of sort, we can't enumerate the risk, the parade of horribles that could befall us because they're often so far out in left field. You know, one Reddit troll decides that they take an issue with you and, you know, it's blown up. So it, it's hard for us to kind of really enumerate those things and honor, I think, the, the medical model of informed consent. So, I mean, the, the, I think the speech really kind of gets down to being featured in a work of journalism could mean really good things for you. It could mean really bad things. People are going to prejudge you, maybe positively, maybe negatively. And, and there's not much I can do with that because when it's out there, it's out there. That's the most honest thing I think we can say without getting into the kind of kind of therapeutic language of informed consent. Um, I think that might make me an outlier, but I still find a, the term a little bit problematic. Interesting. Let's, let's, let's hear from JD and then, and then we'll hear from Bruce. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought as much about like the applicability of the medical sense of the term. So thank you, Lisa, for those um, remarks. Something that I have worked a lot on in the last couple months with my colleague, Tamit Shafiq, um, the two of us are working on a KUFA-sponsored um, investigative piece on suicides on university campuses across the country. And because the piece is a little more sensitive, we've thought through a a number of considerations about informed consent. Um, And we've put together this like work in progress, like ethics form that we send to potential sources because um, as other panels have mentioned, like the ask is big these days, but the ask that Tamid and I are offering people in particular is just like so phenomenally large, like talk about this person you love that you've lost um, to this tragedy. So some of the things that we've included in it in our definition of informed consent um, are like unpublishing policies, um, recording policies, potential for anonymity, um, what the full interview and involvement process looks like from like initial consultations all the way to fact checking. Um, And also just like a couple of the post publication things that can come up, although Um, As Lisa said, it's very difficult to fully anticipate the whole scope of what is possible. Um, These are all just like parts in the process that I think journalists tend to take for granted that um, are involved in the the process of putting an article together. But we have to remember that 
most people we talk to who are not media trained are not going to know any of this. So when they are consenting to being part of a story, they are also consenting to all these different um, elements in a process. Um, and I think any sort of informed consent at the level that I am considering these days is going to require such an explanation. Mm -hmm. Bruce, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think those are really good points. Um, and I take Lisa's point that informed consent is you know, probably not the, the best term to use. Again, I'm, I'm no medical expert, but my, my limited knowledge of it is that it is something different than what journalists do, obviously. Um, in the same way that I'm not sure I'm not sure in practical terms, journalists have a duty of care to their sources or should, because of course a doctor has duty of care because they're operating on you. They're taking knives and scalpels and whatever. Journalists don't do that, right? I, I, so I think to my mind, and again, based on my research about the differences between sort of academic human-based research and journalism, I think it's it's less about informed consent per se and a duty of care per se than treating people who give you their information about their lives and their personal experiences in a more respectful, honorable kind of way. And I think to Jadine's point, being really clear about what the potential um, ramifications are. I think historically, in order to get that human face in the story, journalists really sort of underlined that you could be on the front page of the paper. All your friends will see you. This will be so exciting for you to talk to a journalist or be on the six o'clock news. Um, and they sort of underplay like that. But this could also follow you around for the rest of your life. This could impact your ability to get a job later on. So I think we have a, an obligation there to sort of do both, especially, as Jadine said, with um, what I sort of think of as sort of ordinary sources, i.e. not experts. So people who are not media trained, not media savvy. So we're not talking about politicians or CEOs. We're talking about average ordinary people who are human face for complicated stories that as journalists really help us tell those stories. But it's those people who, again, without the kind of media training or experience that experts have, I think have the most to, to lose when they talk to journalists. And again, are so wrapped up in the idea that someone's being friendly with them, which they may interpret erroneously as being having a level of care for them. Um, it's very flattering, as Janet Malcolm has famously said, to talk to a journalist. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's lots of things to consider there. I want to follow up on that. What are the, and Bruce, maybe you can, you can answer this, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go back to J.D. and Lisa, but what, what are that you mentioned differentiating in your mind between sources for whom uh, a more explicit conversation about what it means to be quoted are necessary and sources for whom such conversations are not necessary. But what are your rules for figuring out which sources are, are in which of those categories? What, what are your rules for figuring out when you have to give a detailed uh, sort of talk about what it means to be in the media and when you really can just skip the talk? Um, what principles do you fall back on? To be clear, I don't have any rules. So that the work I've done in this is sort of philosophical and abstract at this point. And I think I think the sure. next step of this kind of conversation is for people to actually operationalize it and see what this looks like in practice. Um, and I know that um, Sean Holman uh, at the University of Victoria, who's working on a climate disaster project, is actually trying to do this with the research yeah. he's doing with and his students are doing with climate disaster survivors. Um, similar to the way that, that JT talked about, like, here's what the process looks like. To get back to your question, though, um, I think to me, the people who who would most benefit from uh, an increased level of sort of informed consent, if you will, or or explanation, um, are again ordinary people, right? So the human faces we put on stories. So not experts, not CEOs, not politicians, um, not people who work with the media every day, not people who are coming to the media with a with a specific kind of almost sort of marketing public <laughs> publicity kind of request, but people who have probably never spoken to a journalist before and may never speak to one again, who just happen to be in the middle of a story. Um, I think those people are the ones who have the most to lose and therefore deserve um, the most careful sort of attention in, in terms of explaining, as JD said, the process in terms of what you're going to go through. Because I think many people don't even understand the basics of, if I interview you today, you will never hear from me again. The next time you will see anything about this is probably on the you know the six o'clock news tomorrow and you actually don't get any say in what it looks like or which pieces of the interview I've used or not. Um, but again, as well, like how long, how long this lasts. And, and if you're unhappy with the final product, your very limited um, ability to, to get any sort of recourse. Hmm. Um, did, did people have anything to add? Did Jadine or, uh, or Lisa have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, actually, I do. A question that I ask myself when I'm considering this is, what does this person owe the public? Um, mm. And depending on that answer, the sort of process will be very different. Like, obviously, public figures, politicians, um, anyone who has signed up to be held accountable um, isn't going to owe the public far more. So we don't really 
have to have these like detailed conversations about like, here are the repercussions of you being out in the public eye because they already know that they've signed up for it. It's their job. Um, whereas an ordinary person doesn't really owe the public anything in most cases. Um, and especially if they've been through something traumatic, I can see why it is public interest for their story to be told, but at the same time, they are private citizens. So the main question I ask myself is like, what, what does this person owe me? What does this person owe the public? And that is how I navigate these questions a lot of the time. Yeah, I like I really like this distinction, Bruce and JD, in between, you know, ordinary people and, and and people who are sort of in positions of power and people who owe the public something and people who are who 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 maybe don't. Um, because I think we're getting away from thinking all sources are sources. Um, Lisa, I wanted to give you a, a chance to jump in there. Yeah, and I'd just like to build on what JD was saying about what does the source owe to the public? Because I can think of two different times when I've been in newsrooms where um mm. one of the common challenges has been people speaking out um, in breaking news situations um, because a crime has been committed and they're trying to tell their neighbors to be safe and they're trying to let the authorities know what they've seen. Um, and they're just trying to spread the word. Um, you know, one of them, it was a Toronto-based kind of active shooter situation that I can, I can recall. Um, and those people at that moment are thinking about their neighbors. They want to let them, they're giving eyewitness observations to help people stay safe. Um, in both cases, within 24 to 48 hours, um, I was in newsrooms that were contacted by people who then said, well, now I feel like a target because there's someone out there who knows that I was actively sharing their description. Mm -hmm. um, already discharged their duty to the public at that point, it's done. Okay, the, the immediate um, harm that they were trying to prevent, they have done the best they can. They owe us nothing. And, and in circumstances like that, it's staggering to um, ever hear a response that says, well, no, you know, you've done it. There's no going back. And also in those breaking news situations, the whole concept of truly getting informed consent is it's just not happening. I mean, they're pandemonium. So I think when people kind of speak first and maybe pause and reflect later, we need to give them wide latitude to be able to reflect and rescind, I think. Interesting. And how, how could that work in practice? <laughs> Uh, well, in practice, um, I don't know how it works in terms of, in, as I said, the informed consent part of that is tough in breaking news. In practice, yeah. it um, is pretty straightforward. If I, as a journalist, get a call um, two days later saying, I'm really uncomfortable with the fact that, you know, I am seen as someone who's uh, providing information that may uh, make me a target. Uh, they call the journalist, the journalist brings that to whoever the decision maker is, is on these matters. And also think about the informational value, the, the kind of thing that a reporter can can actually say on behalf um, of an eyewitness. And the information, if our purpose is in sharing the information for public safety, we've done it. There's just no need mm. to keep the risk out there. So I think that's a pretty easy one that we can undo. Mm. Well, one of the things that's coming out of this conversation is, is a sense of comfort with sometimes retracting or sometimes taking information down, which is something that I think in the past was considered a, a, a sort of verboten in journalism. You know, there's a sense that when it's done, it's done. You said it, you said it, it's on the public record now. Uh, you can't retract what you said, that's impossible. That would require going back in time. Nobody can do that. Um, this conversation seems to be really moving away from that. And I think journalism is moving away from that. Um, I guess I have two follow-up questions. One, what is the fear? Why are people, perhaps reticent to offer people the chance to retract or have their information taken down. And I guess the second question, related question is what, what do you, what are the, in, in what kinds of scenarios would you offer somebody a chance to take their information down? And in what kind of scenarios would you not? Because my sense is that this is very case by case and maybe JD and we can, we can start with you here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, can, I can speak first to the second question because I deal with that quite often. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think about it very much in the same terms as how we grant anonymity at diversity, um, which is we've got a couple of different metrics. Everything is done on a case by case basis. And we try to be as slow and considerate with it as possible because we understand the gravity of these decisions that we're making. Um, so those metrics generally are like, is there a reasonable fear of repercussions, such as like losing your job um, if your name is on the record? Um, is there a threat to safety? in any way? Or is this a matter of privacy? For example, if somebody has shared details about a sexual assault that they have experienced and um, that kind of information being attached to their name just like shouldn't be out there in the public. So when I receive um, a request to have the record amended so that somebody's name is no longer attached to what they've said or done, um, I use those exact same metrics that we use pre-publication to decide how to 
grant them more degrees of anonymity so that um, just it's not as big of an issue for them anymore. Um, and that's, that, I guess, really only applies to cases where people are wanting to have their names detached um, from the record. Yeah. I haven't dealt as much with like people wanting to retract specific things they've said. It doesn't really come up very much for us. Um, but that's sort of how I think about it. Simon, would you be able to remind me of the first question again? Why is it that journalists are uncomfortable with doing that? Why, was, why, why is that so verboten? Right. Um, the thing that I run into the most when I have these conversations with people who aren't thinking about informed consent as much um, is just that they express a fear that if I let sources think too much about what the repercussions are, sources will not want to talk to me anymore. They'll either back out or they'll just be like a little spooked from the start, um, which I can understand where that line of thinking is coming from. Because if I'm talking about like, you can speak to me, but maybe you will be harassed online, or maybe your employer might find out and they'll have these details about you that you wouldn't have wanted them to know. Um, very reasonably, most people would get a little spooked. But I think there is a way of balancing out those considerations with also talking the source through where you're coming from and why it is important for these um, pieces of information to be incorporated into the story that you're writing um, and trying to help them see it from your perspective. Um, I don't think these things are necessarily reasonable on the breaking news circuit, but I have the luxury of working on magazine timelines a lot of the time. So I do try to do that as much as possible. Yeah, it strikes me that a big fear is just that if, if you really were to, Lisa was saying earlier that you all, all, I can't even tell exactly what the possible repercussions from being in a story might be. Um, and so if you try to sort of spell out all the possibilities of what might happen, the fear that I think some journalists have is that a person, everybody would just say no. And, and what I'm getting from you is in your experience, that's not always the case. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time when I explain to people why it's important that we have these conversations and the, that they're on the record, they can understand why it is important, why it's valuable that they tell their story. Um, I, I think we just treat people like people and we let them make these decisions, you know, because I would never want to have something in a story that feels like I coerced it out of someone or to have them feel blindsided by the consequences of talking to me. Um, that would feel far worse, honestly, than struggling a little to get a source. Mm -hmm. um, Bruce, did you want to jump in here? Sure. I, th I think those are really great points. I think um, I think what, what this makes me think of is, again, so the research about human sources and in, in academic research. Um, and a lot of the, the reading that I've done is about feminist research methodology in particular, which really foregrounds this idea that we need to, as J.D. said, treat people as people as opposed to... Mm -hmm you know, repositories of information that is there for the picking, and then you wander away and do whatever you like with it. And I think mm -hmm. one of the key philosophies there is that um, this idea of consent is not a one-time discussion or question. It's actually ongoing. So it starts before you agree to talk to the interviewer, and, and it persists post-publication, right? So to Lisa's point, can you get really great consent at a breaking news kind of event? Probably not. But then I think the flip side of that is if you can't, and someone still talks to you, when they call you up two days later and say, I, I think I regret that I don't want my name there, then you're obligated to have that discussion saying, okay, well, you know, we can take your name down, we can take your name down, but put a description of who you were, or why we've taken your name down, or provide some more context if you think that helps. Like, I think, it, you know, it's an ongoing conversation with, with lots of different ram possibilities and ramifications. Um, it doesn't, again, I think when journalists think about having to get consent and possibly retract or take down information, they think of it as a, a really all or nothing kind of deal. And, and there's all sorts of options, right? Um, again, the, the feminist research methodology suggestions are plentiful. So some of them are, again, provide more context, remove someone's name, explain that the kind of source they were while removing their name. Um, there's also some examples that I think would actually work just fine for journalism outside of breaking news um, about, you know, this person uh, has issues with how they were portrayed in the story or how their um, anecdotes or experiences were, were used in the story. Um, and therefore, we've given them space in the story to explain what their issues are. It's, sort of, it's a multivocal kind of um, publication, which is really easy to do online because you're not creating any more space. Um, and that sort of gives them sort of equal opportunity to say, here's what I don't like about this. So I think, so I think journalists, as you've suggested, are really concerned that no one will talk to them. And, mm -hmm. I, and again, the academic research suggests that this happens very very little. And when you actually 
the, the studies I've looked at are interesting because they say that when you sort of approach people at the beginning of research project, especially academic ones, which are so long, years and years, right? And say, here's all the cons- the places I'm going to, and times I'm going to come back and ask you for consent. And we're going to talk about this. Most of them just say, yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't have that time. I don't have that interest. I'm happy to be interviewed for 15 minutes and, you know, see your publication before it gets published to make sure my name's spelled properly. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not really that inter- interested. So, Overall, the number of people who want to be interested, very low. The number of people who want a, a flat-out retraction, everything about them removed, um, just before it gets published or after it's published, is actually very low as well. Mm. So, I mean, what I'm getting from both you and JD is that some of the fears about what might happen if we pursue per- informed consent are, are perhaps overflown. That that it, that in fact people will often still say yes. And of course, if people say no, um, thinking to yourself, well, I could have tricked them into saying yes, it shouldn't be in any way comforting to you. Um, Lisa, did you want to um, jump in here at all? Um, I think, um, sorry, th- th- there was a train of thought and there it is gone. So no, I don't think I do want to jump in right now. <laughs> Thanks. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, I, I also really like Jadian's point about some, some of these standards for retractions or, or taking someone's name down are actually the same standards you would just use for having a conversation about anonymity beforehand. And so in, in reality, the, you know, like I was, I was asking, and it was an honest question. I didn't have an answer for it. Like by what standards would you decide to take someone's name down? And, and JD and your point was like, well, those standards already exist. They're the standards we have around anonymity. Um, Bruce, you were saying Simon. earlier on that you think. Yes. Sorry. So I just wanted Please. to just, there was one thing, <laughs> it came back. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, back to Jadine's idea of treating people like people, um, you know, we do have to do that. I'm someone who instinctively loves a great big dose of policy. Policy is so secure and we can, so we can apply it across the board. And this is not one of those, no matter how much I appreciate that. Every one of these matters is individual. Um, you know, what Bruce, and even when Bruce started to kind of draw more from the kind of social science research approach, you know, you think about the idea of kind of continuous and ongoing consent um, for an ordinary individual, leaving aside the time constraints that Bruce was articulating, but that seems perhaps really fair and reasonable for an unsophisticated source. Now imagine that in the context of investigative journalism, I mean, everyone who was trying to see if you could match wits with a journalist to see if they could kind of tell a story that would get them out of the mess could use that as a free pass. And then at the end of it say, okay, well, I'm just withdrawing consent and that interview is off the table. So it really is so specific to the individual um, source and to the individual circumstances. I mean, there's absolutely no way we, any of us can do what we do without making decisions based on our, our kind of moral instincts and our relationships with other people. And I, I totally agree with you that I don't think there were, I don't think you can ever have uh, black and white rules that you just apply across the board. This is just a profession that requires a kind of human intuition. Um, and, and anything we're talking about here is really guidelines about what, what our intuition should be, not, not sort of hard and fast rules. Um, Bruce, you were saying a moment ago that um, consent should be ongoing. Uh, it's not a matter of like, I'll spell everything out to you. Now sign sign here. Now you have consented. End of conversation. Um, what does that mean in practice? What does it mean to continue to get consent throughout the process of reporting a story? And, and maybe, Bruce, since, since you started uh, with this idea, we, we could start with you. Sure. It actually, I mean, based on the, the social science research I've done, looks a lot like what Jadine was talking about with, this, with the story she's working on now. It's that you know, the first step is here's the kind of things I'd like to talk to you about. Here's what my story looks like at this point. Obviously, it evolves. And here's specifically the kind of information I'm hoping to get from you and how it would be used. Like you would be the human face of this story about suicides or sexual assaults. People need to know that. You're not just a stat buried in the story. You are the first thing people read about this in a 7,000 word investigation. Um, from there, you'd probably sort of explain Uh, what the questions will be. And again, in social sciences, that would involve, you know, showing them your questions on paper, while also allowing for the completely normal fact that more questions may arise as you have a discussion with someone. But again, I think a lot of journalists would find that really off-putting as an idea. Um, You'd probably give them a chance to review the transcripts if you're taping the interview to have them go over it. Again, terrifying for journalists, because what if they take something out? And again, the research I've looked at in the social sciences at least suggests that people don't often retract information. They they will offer suggest uh, a, a better way of saying it. And more often than not, it's sort of, you know, they'll come back to and say, I don't want to change anything. But this reading the transcript, maybe think about this other example, um, which is great. Then you've got more data and more information to work with. 
Um, you'd probably show them the draft before it gets published. You would check with them to make sure, again, before it gets published, that everything is okay. Um, and you'd probably reach out to them after publication just to make sure everything looks okay too. Um, again, as Lisa suggested, it, it's not a it's not a quick process. It's not a t- process that is not time consuming. This is something we'd have to be to worked around. Um, but I think that's how it would look sort of operationalized um, if people are actually trying to put these sort of ideas into practice. Um, there's one thing that you said that I definitely want to come back to in a few minutes, which is showing people drafts. Because uh, um, you said that like it was nothing, but there are a lot of journalists who absolutely would, would see that as a, as a big no-no. Uh, and I think we should talk about that because I'm, I'm not sure, it, it's sort of commonsensical that you don't, it's, it's axiomatic that you don't do that. And I'm not sure that it should be. Um, so I do want to come back to that. But first I want to give uh, Lisa and, and JD a chance to, to, to jump in here. Maybe Lisa first. <laughs> I'm really excited to get to this showing the drafts conversation, but, but nothing to add on this particular question. Yeah. We'll get there in a few minutes, I promise you. <laughs> um, let's, let's hear from Jadine. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I can think to add, because Bruce really covered it, is that like the process that he outlined is like the most important, in my opinion, in stories that involve trauma, because especially in those stories, you want to be like checking in with the source after the piece goes out, seeing if they're okay. Um, And the other element maybe is that um, both panelists have highlighted that consent is an ongoing conversation, but I think um, letting the source know when the last time they can actually withdraw their consent before publication is important Mm -hmm. um, because at different publications, that timeline looks different. And often like journalists are the ones who will know that and the sources won't. Um, So I know with magazines, like the lead time between like printing and distribution needs to be factored into that with maybe like a online daily newspaper it's a little different but that is important information for them as well mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um this is this idea of consent being ongoing seems like another way that's sort of a divergence with sometimes the medical model where you consent to surgery and then you don't see the surgeon again until the actual date uh yet yet another reason or yet a further, further reason why lisa's point about the medical model of informed consent being imperfect for, for journalism uh but let, let's get to the big question uh the question about sharing drafts which is something that i was just told you you, you know the, the first time i ever suggested doing that in a newsroom i was made to feel like a very bad person and a very irresponsible journalist. Um, and here we are now, and we're, we're talking about this idea in good faith. Um, and it was never entirely clear to me why this was a bad thing to do. Uh, so I guess I have two questions. Should you, well, I have a bunch of questions. Should we share drafts? Why, historically, why the concern with sharing draft? Why has this historically been thought of as a bad thing or something you shouldn't do? And um, do, do we just do this now? Or are there certain situations in which we do this? Um, maybe let's let's start with Jadeen. Yeah, I guess the same question that I mentioned earlier does factor into this. Like, what does this person owe the public? Because um, if, again, if the person is just like a regular non-media trained person, I'm a little more comfortable with them seeing um, things that are going to go out. I wouldn't ever offer a draft to a politician, anyone else in power. Um, and I will say that also that I haven't actually shown a draft to any source yet, mostly because when they've asked, um, I've generally just explained that it is not something journalists usually do. And I'll offer them like instead a call to go over the details. Um, I think in, in cases where they push a little more, I'm okay doing like, here are the chunks of the transcript I use, here are the specific quotes I pulled, here's how you fit into the story. Um, I don't think I'm fully opposed to the draft thing. I know that I have colleagues at the varsity who actually really argue for this because they're like, sometimes it's the framing and it's the wording that um, really matters. Like my colleague Nawata here, who um, does a lot of like investigations at the varsity has had these conversations with me about how important it is that people understand the specific framing. Um, So I think that's like an argument in favor of showing drafts, but yeah, this is still something I'm very much like, learning how to navigate. I'm interested in yeah. what Bruce and Lisa will have to say. I'm too, because I, I, I don't totally know what I feel about this either. But I, but I do think it's at least time for us to, to be talking about it. And it's at least time for this not, not to be verboten anymore. Uh, let's hear from Lisa. Yeah, yeah, I, the, I 
start from the idea that it is not normally what we do. And, and it's probably not necessary um, most of the time. But we do have to get off this kind of sense of, no, it just doesn't happen. It can't happen. Um, because on some level, it's kind of ridiculous. I'm going to hold from you and not show you something that you and everyone else will see in X days or X weeks. That makes no sense. Um, if a subject is uh, just as... Um, is unhappy after the fact or before the fact, I don't know if that matters, if they're unhappy before the fact for good reason, say, for example, you've misapprehended the facts in a complex story around, around medicine, around science, around climate, around climate change, um, it's a really good thing for you to know that before you, um, miss, uh, before you confuse your audience. Um, and it doesn't, you know, the parade of horribles in the newsroom always used to be, well, then you'll get a lawyer's letter and then they'll try to stop publication. It's like, realistically, who is doing that? Yet, I'm with you, Simon. As, as a youngster in a newsroom, I heard that and heard we don't show these things. And I was just like, yeah, so we never show these things. And it takes a long time before you go, wait, why is that? Mm -hmm. um, can I just quickly tell you about my mentor who has a great experience, a really compelling yes, anecdote please. around this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ivor Shapiro. Yeah, Professor Ivor Shapiro um, mm -hmm. years ago was um, the lead on um, features for Chatelaine magazine. Now, if you're not old enough to have been a news hound in the 90s, quick history lesson. Um, in the 1990s, there was a woman by the name of Sue Rodriguez um, who had ALS and was fighting for the right to die. She took her case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and in the fall of 1993 lost um, her bid to end her own life uh, by a 5 4 split. Within six months, Sue Rodriguez had taken her own life with the assistance of an, an anonymous doctor who acted illegally, but clearly in public interest. And that is where the Canadian physician assisted um, movement really starts. So in December of 1993, or roughly around there, Chatelaine has a profile ready of Sue Rodriguez because she is a giant newsmaker at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, and she had a very powerful friend in the MP, Sven Robinson, who reached out mm -hmm. to Ivor Shapiro as a features lead and said, so Sue is not going to be here by the time this is published, which was essentially tipping his hand that there was a move for her to, um, to find a way to take her own life. So that was a big, you know, that was really a big kind of outlay. So it was, Sue would like to read the profile about her before she goes. Mm. And Ivor then brought that to the managing editor of Chatelaine and was told, mm -mm, no, this is policy. We don't do that. Mm. I don't know if it was weeks or a couple of months away, but the mere fact that the person who was the subject of this, who gave so much to Canadian society and to this publication, was told, no, sorry, you're just never going to get to see this. And that's where it ended. Um, if, if that's the, you know, that, that tells you just how far we've taken this kind of mindlessly and unhelpfully in, in Canadian newsrooms. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an example of that kind of inflexible application of the rules yeah. rather than a sort of human working through of the actual ethics of the particular situation. Mm -hmm. um, there's something very strange about saying, I absolutely will not show this to you, but I will show the whole world shortly. Um, a strange sort of double standard to withhold information that is about to be publicly accessible to absolutely anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and, you know, and then it's, it's doubly strange in the case of, of Sue Rodriguez when she won't actually be around to, to see this profile of this story that, that is her story effectively more than it is McLean's story or, 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 or Ivor Shapiro's story. Um, Bruce, so you, you brought it up. Uh, what do you think about sharing drafts? So it's not something I've done a lot of sort of in my practice as a journalist, because like everyone else, it was not the way I was trained. It's not the way I train journalism students, because I need them to know what the industry is actually like, so they will get jobs and keep jobs. But I think mm -hmm. it's worth talking about. Um, and again, I think it's sort of, I think the practice of not sharing drafts ahead of time, not reading quotes to people when you're fact-checking, not sending chunks of text when you're fact-checking, it all comes down to this idea. I think it comes down to two ideas. One, because I am a journalist, I know best. Mm. I will talk to you, media unsavvy, ordinary person. I will take your life stories. I will take your, your, your anecdotes and your life experiences, traumatic, vulnerable, or not. And I will make sense of them in a way that you are not possible, but you can't do because I know better. Why? Because I went to journalism school because I didn't go to journalism school and I'm still working as a journalist. Like, why? I know better somehow because I have a publication and you don't. I think the other concern for journalists is always if we show them drafts, they will change something. Mm. And, and, and maybe they will, but I think the sort of partner to that is that who says we're changing anything? We're talking about sharing drafts. I'm talking about showing a media unsavvy source. Here's a story in which I've written about your traumatic experience. Does it look right? Because to Jadine's earlier point, 
I mean, ideally you want to catch factual problems, but I, I mean, hopefully with fact checking and good re research and reporting, there aren't a whole lot of those, but it's the framing that is the issue, right? So again, if you contribute a triantic story to a reporter who's working on a piece, thinking that you will be a stat somewhere deep down the story, and instead you were paragraph one with a picture, I think that's important for someone to know. Um, and I think it behooves a journalist to have a discussion with you openly, like not sort of disguise this in from you saying like, you're going to be the face of my story about sexual assault and suicide, but you don't know it yet. Like that's what a horrible thing to think. Um, so, so I think, yeah, if you then showed someone a draft and said, I want you to know your, your page one, you know, paragraphs one through seven, is, how do you feel about that? I don't think it behooves the journalist to make any changes. I think you're still in charge of the story. They've still spoken to on the record, but I think what it does is present an opportunity for you to have a, a thoughtful, human, respectful conversation with someone whose information in life you're using about how that is used and how that is framed. And maybe they'll make a really good argument to make you think, yeah, I'm going to change it. Maybe they won't. We have no idea. Um, but, but I think the act of sort of sharing it with them before everyone else sees it, whether that's an hour ahead or two days ahead or a month ahead, um, seems respectful for me, especially when if, if you're dealing with, again, ordinary sources and or folks who've been through traumatic experiences and they have chosen to share them with the journalist. Yeah, it strikes me, and this is something I hadn't thought of before this conversation, but informed consent doesn't just mean telling people about the journalistic process. It also means telling people about the role they might play in your story, um, and which is something we normally don't do. Somebody finds out they're the main character in a story when they read the story itself. Um, and what you're saying reminds me of something that, that stuck in my head earlier from, from David Canby from The New Yorker, who, who was talking in an earlier panel about part of the reason that fact checkers call every source in The New Yorker is because it's a courtesy to tell people that they're going to appear in The New Yorker. It's a courtesy to tell people that this story is going to happen and give, give people a sense of the timeline. Um, and and I, I guess you're sort of saying something similar here, that there's also just a courtesy in, in saying the story's now about to come out. And, you know, I was hoping that you would, you would occupy this role in this story um, rather than letting the person find out the timeline and their role in the story when the story itself runs. Um, I'd like to turn over to questions now because I'm sure people have lots, lots to say. Does anybody here who's, who's with us have, have a question? Yeah, please, Aaron. Um, one thing... Do we, we might be able to get a microphone over to you. <laughs> or you can just yell. Um, so this has been a great discussion. And one thing that I've been thinking about is, I think some of this discussion has assumed a little bit that uh, as the journalist, you're getting to decide the story you're writing, you're getting to decide the sources that you're going to speak mm. to. And therefore, like, you have you are interested in doing the story and you're seeking consent mm -hmm. from a source for a narrative that you have planned. Um, because we're at a journalism school, uh, a lot of people will start their journalism careers, say doing general assignment mm -hmm. news reporting, mm -hmm. where you do not get to decide the type of story yep. you're doing. And you are sometimes sent out and told, go knock on this person's door, you know, their son just died and ask them about that. How does this conversation, like how can it apply also to the journalists who didn't necessarily consent to be part of the story that they're reporting? Yeah, does, does anybody want to run with that? It's a great question. I mean, I'm seeing it more as a question of, of how we, whether or not we can decline um, assignments in, in newsrooms. I'm, I'm not, mm. uh, it's interesting, the idea of the employees. Um, sorry, <laughs> this is me trying to form thoughts in real time. I'm sorry. Mm. I hadn't thought about the, about the journalist employees informed consent to participate in the story. Yeah, because I, I have a very magazine bias where the story is something that I have a kind of ownership of, and I make all these decisions about my relationships with my sources. But but of course, as you point out, that's not always the case. I, I guess I feel like one one option, and something that, that that Lisa you brought up earlier, is publications having that flexibility to retract people's names after the fact. Um, you know, in, in this scenario you mentioned, in which somebody knocks on a door and gets a comment from a person without explaining in, in, in the moment after something kind of devastating has happened, publications as a matter of policy being okay, potentially retracting someone's name, at least in the online version. Um, yeah, does it, I, 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 I don't know much about outside of the magazine world, so I'm a terrible person to answer this question, but maybe Bruce or JD, do you, do you have anything to add to that? I think all I would say is that, um... I mean, I think we have to recognize that general news reporting, breaking news, and sort of feature writing magazines, so like they're two different animals, right? So so I think some of these rules will apply differently to those situations. Um, and, and to the speaker's point, yeah, I mean, if you're sent out in general assignment to do a, a, you know, a door knock right now, you don't have a lot of choice in the matter. And, and to like, as we were discussing about earlier, 
yes, you're probably trying to get as much consent as possible, but to me, this is probably a case where you would hope that the publication has lots of flexibility on the post-production end to sort of help them there. Um, and I actually think we're seeing this. So um, when I started doing this kind of research, I mean, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about it. Everybody thought it was loopy for even discussing that, you know, maybe we should ask sources these kinds of questions. Um, and when I started doing more research two years ago, it was it was, it was getting better because, of course, there's, there's been much more interest in sort of broadly trauma-informed reporting, like folks from Matthew Pearson. Um, but it was interesting. I saw, I think it was in June, um, both the Toronto Star and the Boston Globe now have forms you can fill out online if you would like um, stories to be unpublished. And again, that doesn't mean they will unpublish it. They, they still expect you to tell the public editor, you know, what the issue is with the story, like Jane Deaton was talking about before. Maybe you can't get a job. Maybe it reports that you were charged with the crime, but doesn't actually underscore the fact that you were, you know, nothing ever happened with it. The charges were dropped. So they may sort of alter the story, take your name out of it you make all those changes. Um, but even, again, four or five years ago, I don't think anybody in major newspaper business would talk about willingly on publishing anything. It just wasn't thought about, right, before the whole you know, right to be forgotten in Europe. Um, so yeah. the fact that we now see major papers like the Star and, and the Boston Globe creating automated forms to help people through this, I think suggests that even in breaking news, even in newspaper news, um, people are, are more open to these kinds of conversations than ever before, post-production. Yeah, you know, I've, I've framed this conversation around what should journalists do, but maybe a better question and a question I should have asked is what should publications do or what, what should anybody who shapes the industry be doing? Um, Jadina, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I also have magazine bias. I've never been on the breaking news circuit. Um, but what I like about this question is it really does highlight like the power dynamics at play here. Um, I think we as journalists are not always the people who hold the full power because we are subject to like the larger dynamics of the publications we work for. Um, I think I feel that particularly so because I am still quite young, um, still only really in the first couple of years of my career. So if my editor told me to do something, I would feel like I had to do it. Um, and I think that is generally very much the same for people in my position. Um, we don't necessarily always feel like we have the position to push back. Um, so really just thinking about like journalists as laborers too, um, not just like the people who control the public record, because sometimes we're not, I don't know, this, this is interesting, it gives me some stuff to think about. And I think at the varsity, where I do have more power over things, I wouldn't ever, I wouldn't ever ask one of our reporters to cover something or speak to a source in a way that makes them feel uncomfortable. Like those are conversations that we would take the time to have and I would want every reporter working under me to feel like they are consenting to the work that they are doing. So I don't really know what it looks like in the wider industry. I get the sense that that's not the case, but that's what we do at the varsity. Yeah. But, it, you know, I've, I've framed this conversation as a sort of power dynamic between journalists and sources, but really we're dealing with a couple of power dynamics, the power dynamic between journalists and sources, and also the power dynamic between journalists and their bosses or journalists and editors. And yeah, absolutely. I, I think to some degree, some of the changes we're arguing for are perhaps changes that need to come from the level of the publication, not just from the level of, of individual journalists. Um, yeah, please. Kind of riffing, I don't know if this is on. Can you hear? Yeah. Yes. Riffing off of that, the thinking about it, not only like journalist and source, but maybe even like editor and new writer. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering what kind of obligations we have in terms of like informed consent for people who are new to writing, whether it's a, a person who knows that they want to do journalism forever or some people, especially when writing their own stories, it might be a one off kind of thing, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about, you know, when publications are looking for stories for Pride Month or for Black mm, History Month. Mm -hmm. And there's this kind of extractive thing. So I'm wondering if there's a conversation around informed consent that we should have here, um, especially about a, a digital footprint, like mm, especially mm -hmm. if if there's a 17 year old um, going to a student publication who's been sexually assaulted and she's feeling really empowered to write that story, mm -hmm. um, but having a conversation around informed consent, you know, making you know, letting people realize just how much a digital footprint can mm -hmm. follow you mm -hmm. throughout your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, such, such a great question. Does, does somebody want to jump in there? I think in the past, the journalistic ethic was, well, if you want to be a writer, you need to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you need to tell that story. You need to go knock on that door. You want to be a journalist? Like, get to it, you know? Um, 
I'm sensing from you a lot of discomfort with that mentality. And I, I think we should yeah. all be uncomfortable with yeah, that mentality. I guess, I guess my question is, you know, what kind of obligations do editors have to just put that on new writers or yeah. people who are new to this as radar? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Can I jump in on this? Please do. Because um, I do primarily work with people who have had no experience with the industry, like sometimes no exposure to writing in public in general. So I feel like this is actually right up my alley. Um, and I do sometimes get unpublishing requests from people who are like, hey, I wrote this terrible opinion 10 years ago and now it is impacting my ability to get a job. Can you take it down? Um, and I don't really know that at the varsity we do enough to really underline the fact that once something is out there, it's out there. And un unless it violates our policies or makes you unsafe, then it's going to stay up. Um, but I definitely think that at least in the student sphere, I can't speak for um, the professional world, but I, I do think that editors have a responsibility to their writers to be walking them through the consequences of what might happen, especially if they put out something um, very personal, very intense. Um, but also a lot of the time when those stories come to our desks, the writers themselves are already asking for degrees of anonymity because maybe just like people who have grown up in the digital world already kind of understand the repercussions of putting themselves out there and they already know that they want anonymity. So we're having those discussions from the start. Um, but I think that's something we should be doing more is just underscoring the semi-permanence permanence of having something on the internet. It seems like one of the things that's happened in our world is a lot of these old norms we created were norms created in a pre-digital era where if you were in a story, that story got published, then the magazine or newspaper went to the recycling bin or the trash, um, and then it went into the archives, and no future employer was going to go and read the archives and dig up your article on microfilm. Um, so it was fundamentally temporary. Um, that has completely changed, and yet it seems like we're still working with the norms that were, were created during that old pre-digital era, and it, and it seems like those norms fit very, very awkwardly with, with the moment we have the moment we're in right now. I wanted to, to move on to another question because I know there was a question over on the side of the room here. Hey, hi, thanks. This is really interesting. Um, so uh, I'm gonna lead into my question with like uh, a little uh, Teutonic anecdote. So I worked <laughs> as a journalist for 12 years in, in Germany and um, what's customary in German journalism is that you uh, provide the quotes to your sources. Like mm. you don't provide the text, but it is very common for political reporters and just all beat reporters to, to provide just the quotes. And so people grow to expect that. But of course, the only people who actually capitalize that are the politicians, mm -hmm. not the average person on the street. And that's just a random anecdote that leads into my actual question, which is, you know, increasingly, I feel like even like to get informed consent from random people on the street if that person is a woman or racialized or trans, I kind of feel like even if you are doing an innocuous story on uh, ice cream, like that person can get doxxed. And you, do you know what I mean? Like the, the, this is um, the reality of where we are in this digital era that you're talking about. So my question is, should we also be talking about just providing writ large anonymity in the way that you've opened a huge can of worms and said, <laughs> you know, should we be allowing sources to, to look at, um, at text before publication? And, you know, I asked that in terror, also knowing, you know, the history of Jimmy's world and, you know, the Pulitzer Prize winning, you know, journalist who, you know, invented her sources and this continues 40 years onwards with mm -hmm. German Spiegel reporters. Anyway, so yeah, that's the can of worms I want to ask the, if I'm If I'm understanding correctly, the can of worms is should anonymity sort of be the default when you're talking For to- For average people on the street, yeah. Okay, let's, um, that's a great question. Let's let's go there. Should should we default to I mean, anonymity? Do we need for... to know their last name to, I mean, I understand the argument of transparency, mm -hmm. but does the audience care? And aren't we writing for them? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Um, let's, 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 uh, throw that out there. Should anonymity just sort of be our default for certain kinds of sources? Um, does anybody have, have strong feelings one way or another? If you would unpack the, for certain kinds of sources. So is this the idea of, of again, back to the kind of Vox Pop people, those, those folks on the street? Yeah, I think, I think that's the idea. People for whom their relationship to the story is quite tenuous. You just ask them a question on the street or you knocked on their door. Um, they're, they're just a representative of sort of the public. I mean, 
maybe if it's super innocuous, but I think if it's that innocuous, I'm going to start to wonder about whether or not this is really um, discharging, you know, or really honoring the idea of informing the public, you know, how do you feel about the first snowfall in November um, is not really changing anything. So I guess we could give those people anonymity, but the greater question is what are they doing um, in our stories? And it's not just journalism that has this idea of kind of standing up and putting your name to your belief. I mean, this, this underpins a, a, an awful lot of faiths as well, right? I mean, to testify is to put, to stand up and to stand stand behind your point of view. Um, and I think, again, there are always exceptions, so many exceptions, but the idea that overall we um, may let anonymous sources provide facts, but not just kind of, you know, uh, you know angry opinions about things is, is a fundamental one because we're also up against the competing tension of too many people wondering if journalists are just making all of this up. Um, mm. So in the interests of protecting, you know, a lot of sources, do we further undermine public trust in us? And, and I was really interested in the, the last, uh, the, the question from, from the last speaker, because this whole idea of yes, to just dare to have an opinion if you are a racialized person or a trans person um, is true, yet you know, 20 years ago, we mindlessly said, boy, we sure have to stop making it look in our stories like everybody with an opinion is a white man. So let's get out there and diversify our sources. Um, and we did super naively without thinking about just what we were subjecting our, our forces to. So like most, you know, adult problems, the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of competing interests here and it's tough to, to kind of untangle it. Um, thank you so much for that. And do, do other people have feelings on a sort of blanket assumption of an anonymity for, for certain kinds of sources? I mean, I, mean, I, I oh, go ahead, JD. I'll, you can go please, ahead. JD I, and then, I will. Okay, please. sure. JD and um, then Bruce. All right. I think that I kind of like the care that is taken with anonymity and the processes that um, we use at the varsity. I really like that they're thoughtful, slow conversations about the consequences of putting someone into a piece. Um, I would personally feel really cautious with using anonymity as a default um, because I generally think that there are people out there who understand the consequences of being public and are okay with it. Um, for example, like even if you can't find like a regular, regular person to be in the store, you might be able to find an advocate who is a regular person, but is also like already in public enough that it is not as much of an issue for them. Um, I, I think that we're also in a moment where journalistic trust feels very delicate. Um, and I think the, the more we can be doing to preserve that trust while also like maintaining a delicate balance of protecting people, um, that's like so much of what I think about currently. Um, and yeah, just, I think that if, if conversations about anonymity are thoughtful enough and available enough, we don't necessarily have to make anonymity the default. Mm -hmm. I think the fear with, with, with just um, making anonymity the default is that, that, that having your name attached to something also makes you accountable. And there's a sense, I think, in journalism that you want people to be accountable, that you don't want journalism to be sort of like a Reddit, uh, you know, or like a, like a 4chan kind of forum where people are anonymous and they can say all kinds of things and have no, no, no sort of accountability for the things they say. So I think that that's the tension we're always dealing with when we're talking about anonymity. On the one hand, protecting people um, by, by removing their names, and on the other hand, uh, holding people to account by putting their names there. And I think that's probably why there's a journalistic, or one of the main reasons why there's a journalistic bias towards naming sources. Um, Bruce, I wanted to give you a chance to, to jump in. I mean, Jadine said it so much better than, than I could. But again, mm -hmm. I, I think her point was, was exactly right, that, that I think blanket anonymity um, anywhere sort of works across purposes because it doesn't give journalists the chance to have really good conversations with both the, the people in their own newsroom about what the choices they're making, but also their sources. And I think it's in those discussions that actually the, the good stuff comes out. Mm -hmm. um, do we have time for another question? We have one minute. Um, maybe we should just wrap up then. Um, thank you. This has been such a lovely conversation. There were so many things that I hadn't thought of that I'm now thinking about now. Uh, it was such a joy speaking to all three of you. So thank you so much for showing up and, and, and bringing your thoughts and ideas. It's been a pleasure chatting. Thank you so much, Simon. Thanks for having us.